This is going to be John chapter 6. And we're going to look at the subject of why do false teachers seek Jesus? You see, a lot of false teachers and false converts who at times seem as if they seek Jesus. Maybe they know about the power of Jesus, but their motives are wrong. Maybe it's for money or fame. But a common thing with a bad preacher is he sees the success of a good preacher and desires that success. And maybe he hears him preach on getting power through prayer or through reading the Bible by seeking the Lord. So he begins to seek the Lord, but with the wrong motive. And although they are in the ministry for all the wrong reasons, they even themselves know there is something about the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, a man named Simon the sorcerer who was bewitching the people in the book of Acts, when he saw the work of the apostles, he believed. But it seems like he really got saved, but his motives after salvation were wrong. He tries to buy the apostles' power with money. He wanted to be a great one. He knew the power came from Jesus Christ, and the apostles had that power. So let's go through John 6 and see some characteristics of these kinds of people. Why do people seek Jesus with the wrong motive? What's their motive? Is it because he's the Savior of the world, and they know that's the only true Savior, and they want to give him glory? Or is it for other selfish reasons? Look at John 6, verse 22. It says, The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one wherein two his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh to the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves. He did eat of the loaves and were filled. Notice the Lord knows the bad motive of the people. They were seeking him for the wrong reasons. Why do you seek Jesus before you teach or before you preach or before whatever you do? Is it because you want power to preach so that you can be exalted yourself or so that Jesus Christ can be exalted? Is it because you're looking to get your belly full you're looking to get noticed and admired by someone uh, matthew 6 2 says therefore when thou doest thine alms do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men verily i say unto you they have their reward our main mission should be to get jesus glory and not ourselves why do you seek jesus are you trying to get your own glory he said you seek me not because you saw the miracles but because you did eat the loaves and were filled this is because their god was their belly they were concerned with themselves in philippians 2 4 it says look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others Philippians 3, 18 and 19, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So they were concerned with getting their belly full. And some men preach or are just in the ministry because there can be good money in it if you deceive Simple-minded people. Ecclesiastes 6, 7 says, All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. All these fake preachers with millions of dollars just keep preaching. They can't get satisfied. 
I mean, if you already deceived others and got yourself $40 million, then why continue to preach? Why continue to deceive? It's because their God is their belly. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Not only are these men disqualifying themselves from being pastors because of the filthy lucre, but also because of their covetousness. 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, some qualifications, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. That's qualifications for a pastor. And yet you see many whose God is their belly, just like these people who were seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons. Not only do they want money, they want your money, and will guilt trip you into giving it with deception. John 6, 27, back in the chapter we're studying, John chapter 6 and verse 27, it says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So these money-hungry ministers are laboring for the meat which perisheth. Maybe they are saved. I'm not judging a man's salvation. But what is their motive? When God looks at their work, he is going to see what sort it is. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And that's the opposite of what these people were doing in John 6, 27. It says, labor not, Jesus said, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So Jesus Christ, he's the bread. And meat in the Bible doesn't have to be just like steak and chicken. It can be food in general. Uh, Jesus is the bread of life. Uh, you get him, the meat which endureth forever, and you get everlasting life. You labor for the true bread of life after you're saved, and you'll get a treasure that fadeth not away. So John 6, 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Jesus is sealed. He was sealed from the beginning. He didn't need two births like we do, because he was born of God his first birth. Now, that's just when he came as God manifest in the flesh. But... Jesus Christ has always been and always will be. He's one with the Father. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's one God and three. One and three and three and one. But Jesus didn't need a new birth because he was God. He was already born of God. He had God's blood running through his veins. Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost. She was a virgin born. But I myself, I didn't get born of God until the second birth. And that's when I got sealed. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now John 6.28, it says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? See, they want to know how to work the works of God, not because they care about God, but because they want power. They want their belly filled. And they are minding earthly things. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of the God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. The work of God is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus got baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness. He was sinless. He did all the works. 
Now you just have to believe on him and you get his righteous record applied to your record and your sinful record taken away. And that's why you don't have to work your way to heaven. You couldn't work your way to heaven. Only Jesus had the works. And that's why you have verses like Romans 4, 5, which says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's not by works. It's by God's mercy and grace that we can be saved and go to heaven. Now John 6.30 it says, They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? So see, these false teachers love signs. And people respond to things they physically see with their eyes. If a man counterfeits the signs of an apostle today, then he will get a huge following. And this is why you have so many fake healers and tongue speakers and exorcists and all that. But I seen this guy from Africa the other day or somewhere. Somehow he caused a small whirlwind or something to appear before the congregation. I'm sure it was either coincidence or some type of CGI because the guy doesn't even have the right gospel. Or it could be just the power of Satan. But I'm sure it's just some type, something like that. But even if it was real, it's not of God because the man didn't even have the right gospel. And that's how we know he's a fake. I'm more concerned with, is he teaching what the Bible says, not does he have signs and wonders. So the Lord isn't in a million miles of that. Now, he may be allowing the devil to deceive those people as a judgment on those people. But when it comes right down to it, that's not of God. And these false teachers claim to work the works of God through signs and lying wonders. And that's what false prophets do. John six thirty one through 32 says, Our fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, or did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So that manna back there pictures the word of God and the living word, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true bread from heaven. So why, why do you read the word of God, the written word? Because you want to be closer to Jesus Christ? Do you want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you just wanting to be able to cut people's heads off with the sword because you know more doctrine? What's the motive? What's your motive of reading the Bible? What's your motive of studying the Bible? 1 Corinthians 8 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Jesus Christ is the true bread from heaven. And the word is like bread. Sometimes when you read it, you can feel in your spirit a satisfied feeling like you have after a warm meal. Reading it with a sincere heart and the right motive will open up the word of God to you. So don't approach it like you know more than God does. Don't approach it being skeptical. Approach the Bible like it's right and like you're wrong because anytime you disagree with it you are wrong now verse 33 for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world John 3 13 says and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven so Jesus Christ is he which came down from heaven He's the real visitor from another world. And he left the riches of heaven to come down and save our wretched soul. 
2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And this is rich in faith. If your motive during your works for God aren't getting people saved and getting God the glory, then you aren't acting like you're rich in faith. You're just greedy of filthy lucre and glory in yourself. This is the problem of many pastors and teachers today. Serving God and seeking God for the wrong reasons. It shouldn't be about self-promotion. It shouldn't be about money. It shouldn't be about making a name for yourself. It should be about getting people saved. It should be about getting glory to God. It should be about eternal things. So he came to give life to a world that hates him. The Bible says, Jesus said, Marvel, marvel not if the world hate you. Ye you know it hated me before it hated you. Now John 6, 34 and 35, it says, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So he's telling them how to get it. But they don't get it. They're looking for something material to handle. Jesus is the bread and the living water, and that is why if you drink him, you will never thirst. Salvation is simple as just taking a drink of water. If you're thirsty, you just take a sip. But notice they just don't understand spiritual things because they don't believe. And 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. John 6.36 But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And that's the problem their heart. It doesn't believe. They don't even believe it when they see it. But the Lord is looking for a believing heart, just like the eunuch had in Acts chapter 8, when he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just like Paul preaches in Romans 10, 9 through 10, where he says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in Hebrews eleven six it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. John six thirty seven says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So these people could have taken the true bread of life because Jesus will save anybody. Anybody who comes to him will be saved. Pedophile, rapist, homosexual, whoever. He died for all sin. 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So do you believe that Jesus died for every sin? Do you believe uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Then why do you believe certain people can't be saved? Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you really think he's going to go through all that, come down, be born of a virgin, live 30 years and go without sinning and then he, he left the riches of heaven became poor and then died a bloody death on the cross shed his blood he purchased us with his own blood do you think he's going to do all that and then a lost sinner come to him with with the, with the true desire to believe the gospel and be saved, do you really think he's going to turn that sinner down because of some sin that they've committed or some lifestyle that they've had? No, the true bread from heaven is offered to every man. Jesus Christ is a ransom for all. And 
He said, All that the Father give me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Uh, nobody's too bad to be saved. Just like nobody's too good to save themselves. There's nobody too bad to be saved. Paul said, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So if you're ungodly, and you know you're ungodly, you're eligible to be saved. And it's simple to be saved. Paul gave us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Jesus Christ died. He died by shedding his blood on the cross. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. And I've already told you the verses in Romans 10 where it says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's it. That's all you got to do. Come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe on the gospel. Believe on what Jesus did on the cross to be your payment for sin. But this has been John chapter 6.